started. Welcome everyone to tonight's program entitled the suffrage movement in New York state with a special emphasis on Westchester County. We are very lucky tonight to have Colleen, Colleen Faye, excuse me, um, speaking tonight. She was a graduate of Rutgers University and the New York University School of Medicine. And um, she belongs to the Women's Club of White Plains and the Westchester County Geneal Genealogical Society and is a member of the American Association of University Women. Um, so I am honored to have you here tonight, Colleen, and I look forward to your presentation. And this program, by the way, is being sponsored by the Yonkers Historical Society. Okay, shall we start? Yes. Uh, let me try sharing my screen. Okay. Um, okay, so, um, so I just want to thank Michael for inviting me to speak. And um, we may or may not be related. My mother's maiden name was Walsh, although we're all from New Jersey and he's from the Bronx, he said so. But I'm sure somewhere way, way back, there's some connection. So, um, so this presentation um, started out with some research that I did for the centennial of the women's suffrage movement in New York back in 1917. And so, as Michael uh, mentioned, you know, most of the talk is going to uh, highlight the contributions of New Yorkers to the suffrage movement, which was quite easy, actually, because New York uh, was in the forefront uh, of the suffrage movement most of the time. So uh, in the United States, the uh, desire for equal rights for women has been around for centuries, as evidenced by this uh, quote of Abigail Adams to her husband, John, remember the ladies and be more generous to them than your ancestors. And initially, the founding fathers seemed to have it right. Um, after the Revolutionary War, women in all 13 states had the right to vote, but this gradually was rescinded. Um, Massachusetts, you know, interestingly, being sort of the bastion of um, freedom and independence, was the first to rescind women's rights to vote in 1780, followed by New Hampshire in 1784. Uh, when the Constitution was passed in 1787, it placed the voting rights in the hands of the states, and pretty much immediately everyone except New Jersey took back women's suffrage. Uh, New Jersey was the last holdout until about 1807, and it took almost another 150 years to correct this mistake. Rightfully so, um, New York has been considered the birthplace of the women's rights movement. The first convention ever held on uh, women's rights in the United States was held in Seneca Falls in 1848. On the first day, only women were invited and about 200 women attended. On the second day, men were included and about 40 of them came, including Frederick Douglass. There was a second conference held um, about two weeks later in Rochester to an even larger audience. The organizers of Seneca Falls included uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who was born in upstate New York in 1815. She was an excellent speaker and an excellent writer. Uh, she died in 1902 and is actually buried in Woodlawn Cemetery. Lucretia Coffin Mott was born in Massachusetts, but she was educated and actually taught in Dutchess County. She became involved in women's rights when she found out that male teachers made more than female teachers. That may still be true, actually and she later uh, moved to Philadelphia. Martha Coffin Wright, who was Lucretia's sister, moved to Auburn, New York, where she was involved in the Underground Railroad, as well as the suffrage movement. The uh, Declaration of Rights and Sentiments was sort of the sentinel document produced by the convention, and it was drafted largely by Elizabeth Cady Stanton. It was patterned after the Declaration of Independence, but stated that all men and women were created equal. The con convention also adopted a series of resolutions related to women's rights. The most controversial of these was the Ninth Revolution, which stated, resolved that it is the duty of women of this country to secure to themselves their sacred right to the elective franchise. This again was very controversial, but Stanton was adamant that it needed to be passed. And ultimately a hundred people voted for the res resolution, including seven, 68 women and 32 men. And following the convention, various leaders traveled to, around the country lecturing on women's rights to vote. 
Um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, as I said, was a brilliant writer as well as speaker, although because of her family responsibilities, she was not able to travel as much as she would like. But this is one of her more well-known quotes. Uh, a number of authors, however, have sort of questioned um, Seneca Falls as sort of being the birth of the, of the women's suffrage movement. And um, there have been two books written, one called The Myth of Seneca Falls by Tetrault and A Century of Struggler by Flexner, which questioned this belief. And you know, while they believe that Seneca Falls was an important event, there were other women in other parts of the country who were also advocating for women's rights at this time, particularly small grassroots organizations in some of the other states. And I'll just mention a couple of them. Uh, one of these was Lucy Stone. Lucy was born in Massachusetts in 1818. She was a graduate of Oberlin College and was a pioneering abolitionist as well as a women's rights activist. She preferred, however, to work locally with state governments rather than on a national level like the organizers of Seneca Falls. But with Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan Anthony, she is considered part of the triumvirate of the women's suffrage movement. She's probably best known for her refusal to take her husband, Henry Blackwell's name. He, however, was entirely in agreement with this. And she and her husband published a weekly feminist newspaper known as the Women's Journal. Lucy was also one of the founders of the American Equal Rights Association, as well as the American Women's Suffrage Association. Another woman who was active traveling the country at the time was Sojourner Truth. Sojourner was born Isabella Bamfrey in 1779 in Ulster County, and she was enslaved until 1827 when New York outlawed slavery. In 1843, she renamed herself Sojourner Truth, and she lectured widely on the women's suffrage and abolitionist movement. Her most famous speech from which this quote is taken, Ain't I a Woman, was given at the Women's Rights Convention in Akron, Ohio in 1851. She sold, uh, there were these little kind of uh, wallet sized photographs that people sold back during the times after the Civil War became very popular called Cartes de Viste. And she sold those and autographed them in order to make money. She also lived uh, in Austin at one point. And these are a couple other of her more famous <laughs> quotes. You know, she was kind of a down to earth person and sort of told it like it is. But um, I like the second one, particularly the last line. I will not allow my life's life to be determined by the darkness around me. So in spite of her battle, she was a, an optimistic uh, woman. Another uh, prominent New Yorker was Matilda Jocelyn Gage. She was uh, born in Cicero, New York in 1826. In 1852, she was a speaker at the National Women's Rights Convention, and she also served as president of the National Women's Suffrage Association. She was considered to be a bit more radical than either Stanton or Anthony, and she felt that women's right to vote was a natural privilege rather than a necessity so that the female virtue could insert influence over legislation. And then of course there is Susan B. Anthony. And although she is not an organizer of the Seneca Falls Convention, her name has become synonymous with women's suffrage. She was born in Massachusetts, but she left home to earn money as a teacher. And actually in 1839, she taught at the Eunice Kenyon's boarding school in New Rochelle, New York, and later moved to Rochester. She was also very active in the anti-slavery and temperance movements. She served as president of the National Women's Suffrage Association. In 1851, she teamed up with Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Stanton often wrote many of the speeches, but Anthony was the one who was able to travel the country to deliver them. She was known as an electrifying speaker. And as I said, she did most of the speaking engagements. She stated she never married because she felt it limited her independence. In 1872, uh, Anthony, as well as 14 other women were arrested in Rochester, New York for voting in the presidential election. They contended that the constitution guaranteed all citizens the right to vote and that New York State was illegally preventing them from voting. She was ultimately uh, taken to trial and sentenced to either a $100 fine or several months in prison. She didn't pay the fine and she apparently never went to jail and the other women were actually never tried. 
Four years later, during the Philadelphia Centennial Celebration, she walked out onto the stage uninvited and handed out copies of the Declaration of the Rights of Women. After Seneca Falls, there were a number of men and women, as I said, traveling the country giving speeches on women's rights, but there was no real central organization at the time. After the Civil War, the movement tried to organize and form the American Equal Rights Association, which advocated for equal rights for all citizens. This, however, was to become a kind of contentious issue because once the 15th Amendment was passed granting voting rights to any man, but not women, there was a lot of controversy over the support of this. Some of the women, particularly uh, Susan B. Anthony, refused to support the amendment because as I said, it did not include women, but others like Lucy Stone accepted it as a first step towards broadening voting rights. One of the things that the women did agree on was a petition calling for universal suffrage. And this petition was presented to Congress in 1866 by uh, Congressman Thaddeus Stevens, who was a well-known progressive and a quite controversial figure himself. The signers of the petition included Stanton, Anthony, Ernestine Rose, Lucy Stone, and Antoinette Brown Blackwell, who was Lucy Stone's sister-in-law. Despite the initial hopes for this united organization, the American Equal Rights Association quickly broke into two camps, one led by Susan B. Anthony and the other led by Lucy Stone. Eventually the group disbanded and two new organizations emerged. The National Women's Suffrage Association was formed in 1869 by Susan B. Anthony and Stanton. They were politically independent and advocated for broader rights for women, not just the suffrage right. They also differed on their approach. They preferred a campaign at more of a national level. In 1870, Lucy Stone organized the American Women's Suffrage Association. They had ties to the Republican Party as well as the abolitionist movement, but they were focused solely at this point on women's suffrage, and they preferred to work more at the state and local levels. Finally, in 1890, they got back together again as the National American Women's Suffrage Association. Despite their uh, strong uh, leadership, the suffrage movement kind of took a back seat to the anti-slavery and temperance movement after the war. And by 1900, only four states had granted women the right to vote, these being Wyoming, Utah, Colorado, and Idaho. Wyoming and Utah had actually granted women the right to vote when they were still only territories. And in Wyoming, the day the governor signed the law on December 10th, 1869 was declared Wyoming Day. And Wyoming is actually known now as the equality state. Several attempts had been made nationally for an amendment for women's suffrage in 1868 by Senator Pomeroy of Kansas. And two other attempts were made in 1878 and 1870, 1887, which were both voted down in the Senate. By the turn of the century, however, new voices were being heard, particularly in New York. One of the, well, sorry, one of the most well-known of these new suffragists was Carrie Chapman Catt. And I, and I might mention here that in the United States, women prefer to be called suffragists as opposed to suffragette, which was more commonly used in Europe. The Americans felt that suffragette implied sort of a diminutive, and so they preferred to be known as suffragists. Uh, Carrie Chapman Catt was born actually in Wisconsin, but she moved to New York in the early 1900s. By this time, she was a nationally known figure, and her second husband, George Catt, was very supportive of her work. In fact, he had her sign a legal document stating that she was allowed to devote four months per year to her suffrage work. She um, advocated something called the winning plan, which wanted to get women at the grassroots level uh, involved nationally. She was the president of the National American Women's Suffrage Association. She founded the Women's Suffrage Party of New York in 1909. She founded the League of Women's Voters, and she also founded the International Women's Suffrage Alliance in 1923. This is um, one of my favorite quotes of her, no offense to the men in the audience. Another of the women who became prominent this time was Harriet Stanton Blanche. Um, she was born in 1856 in Seneca Falls, and she's the daughter of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. 
She received a bachelor's and master's degree from Vassar College. Harriet actually lived in London for 20 years where she became acquainted with the women's suffrage movement there. And when she returned to the United States in 1907, she formed the Women's Political Union based on the things she learned about the suffrage movement in England. She stated at the time that the suffrage movement was in a complete rut in New York State at the opening of the 20th century. It bored its adherents and repelled its opponents. And she, as she tried to revive the movement, she held large yearly parades with people wearing yellow sashes and banners. She also recognized the growing number of women trade workers and the importance of interesting them in the suffrage cause. And the, this was to become an increasingly important part of the movement. She's also actually buried in uh, Woodlawn Cemetery. As it is today, New York State was a trend center for the country, and the impact of securing the right to vote for women in New York was substantial, as noted by Blanche. Between 1910 and 1914, the National American Women's Suffrage Association intensified its lobbying efforts, and additional states extended the franchise to women, including Washington, California, Arizona, Kansas, Illinois, and Oregon. In 1913, Illinois, led by their future Congresswoman Ruth Hannah McCormick, became the first state east of the Mississippi to grant women suffrage. A year later, Montana granted women the right to vote, thanks in part to the efforts of the first female Congresswoman, Jeanette Rankin. Blanche and Carrie Chapman Catt were largely responsible for revitalizing the suffrage movement at the turn of the century. New York had again become the hub of the women's suffrage movement, a lot of people ask why the suffrage movement seemed to really take off at the turn of the century. And there are a lot of um, theories on this. The progressive movement had become much more popular. The suffrage movement overseas had become more active and, and known here. Women were becoming better educated and more women were uh, entering the workforce. So New York State was kind of the epicenter of the suffrage movement and Westchester County was right up there from Yonkers to Briarcliff and New Rochelle to Portchester and everywhere in between. 35,000 women belonged to the Women's Suffrage Party in Westchester County. There were 102 local organizations. These parties were also involved in work uh, on polio and later in the war effort. And during the war, they um, had committees on granting through the census as well as garden committees because people were growing vegetables so they food could be donated to the troops. Many women supported the formation of a, a suffrage organization on a county as well as local level. And Henrietta Livermore, who's actually from Yonkers, even though she's quoted in the New Rochelle paper, pulled on White Plains to form such a group since White Plains was the county seat. And in fact, the larger cities were expected to step up and help the smaller communities form suffrage groups. And so West Just, sorry, White Plains did step up. And because I live in White Plains, we're getting top billing right now, although lots of other Westchester cities were involved. In 1912, there was a parade in White Plains in which 2,000 people marched. Various uh, county suffrage organizations frequently met in White Plains at the White Plains Club. At the uh, annual White Plains Fair and Horse Show, September 18, 1912, was dubbed Suffrage Day. And Various uh, prominent local and national figures spoke at this, including Elva Belmont and Jane Addams. There was another large parade in 1916, consisting of 75 colorfully decorated cars that attended by three bands, and various speakers and suffragists from the surrounding communities were in attendance. Women from all walks of life supported the movement and contributed in various ways. And these are just a list of some of the White Plains residents that I found. Uh, one woman, S.J. Russell, ran a baby checking service so that women could go and vote and she would watch the babies while they did so. Other women hosted meetings, served as uh, presidents of various associations, uh, including the uh, White Plains Suffrage Association, as well as some of the uh, county organizations as well. Uh, Anna Garland Spencer was another prominent um, White Plains suffragist who, as you see in this quote, noticed that women's rights should have been recognized with the rights of men when our government was created. And in fact, as I said, originally women did have the right to vote. It was not until we actually got a constitution that this right was not protected. 
So some of the suffragists in Yonkers, Yonkers was also a very active area in the women's suffrage movement. And there were a lot of prominent well-known people who were involved, but many other lesser known people, some of whose names I came across, a woman named Mary Walker, who was also um, active in fighting for equal pay. Um, John Andrus, who was the multimillionaire CEO of Arlington Chemical. He was also the former mayor of Yonkers as well as a congressman and a philanthropist. And his family today continues their tradition of philanthropy, particularly with regard to um, children and senior citizens. Uh, Amanda Robinson was another local woman who actually founded the Women's Suffrage League in Yonkers. And even the high school kids got involved. There was a three-way debate on the pros and cons of women's suffrage with New Rochelle and White Plains high schools. The Yonkers Women's Suffrage Association um, was active holding various meetings. Um, in 1913, they held one outside where they had women making speeches out of the back seat of their car. Uh, they tried having another meeting a couple months later, which was not quite as successful, although the mayor and police chiefs were actually supportive of their attempt to organize meetings. The men were also involved in supporting women's suffrage. And the Men's Equal Suffrage League was initially um, formed as a result of an invitation by Anna Howard Shaw to Oswald Villard. Oswald was the editor of the New York Post, and he was invited to the suffrage convention in Buffalo in 1908. Although he did not want to um, head the group, he offered to get together a group of like-minded men who would support the woman. Um, and this group was actually headed by Max Eastman. They operated as an auxiliary of the National Women's Suffrage Association. Uh, according to the local newspaper, in April of 1913, they convened a meeting at Phillipsburg Hall, which was, quote, attended by men and women in beautiful gowns. Now, some of the more specific um, people from Yonkers, uh, Hetty Osterfeld, she was um, born in New York City, but lived in Yonkers for many years. Um, she was actually educated overseas and was described during the war as having connections to the armies on both sides. Um, she was involved in a variety of um, various causes in the Yonkers area, but ultimately devoted her time to the cause of women's suffrage. She chaired the 9th District, which included Yonkers, and uh, headed up the 1913 petition campaign in the New York Sun, which uh, stated that she was the person who assembled all the petitions and forwarded them to a committee in New York City, which then conveyed them to Washington. In 1914, she greeted the suffrage march led by General Rosalie Jones, which was headed for Albany as it passed through Yonkers. She was on the board of directors of the New York Women's Suffrage Association. She also served on the executive committee of, on the International Committee on Marriage and Divorce, a group that worked for uniform divorce laws. So she was interested in, in women's rights in general and not just suffrage. Uh, later on, she joined a campaign sponsored by the Home Bureau of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, canvassing households in Westchester County, where volunteers went to various homes, providing lessons in marketing, menu planning, cooking, sewing, budget making, feeding, and care of children. And their advice uh, was intended to help housewives stretch the dollar. Her husband, Carl, was a physician, but was very supportive of his wife's suffrage activity. And in 1912, it was noted that he was had charge of the men's table at the suffrage market at 180 Madison Avenue, New York City. Sadly, he died by suicide in 1928. She died in a car accident in Mexico in 1940 when they never had any children. Henrietta Livermore, another uh, Yonkers resident, was born in San Francisco. She was a graduate of Wesleyan and married a New York City lawyer named Arthur Livermore when they later moved to Yonkers. Uh, in 1910, she organized a group of suffragists in her apartment. This group ultimately became known as the Women's National Republican Club. She held a variety of positions in the National American Women's Suffrage Association. She was chair of the literature committee, which created and distributed pamphlets around the area. And she was also in charge of the NAWSA suffrage schools, which taught women to organize and to advocate for themselves. And these schools were held all over the country. She was a prolific pamphleteer, including writing one on how to raise money for suffrage. She was a friend of Calvin Coolidge, who was a supporter of women's suffrage. And she became a member of the Republican National Committee in 1920. And it was said that every organization of which she was a member eventually made her president. <laughs> 
When the uh, women finally had their right to vote in 1920, she stated, you have it in your hands to win. You have new ideas, new methods in politics, and I cannot press upon you too strongly the part you have to play in the coming campaign. So she was quite um, forceful in, in trying to get women to get out and vote now that they finally had won that right. Annie Conley um, is another woman who was uh, born to Irish immigrant parents, but lived in Yonkers her whole life. She was the secretary of the Yonkers Suffrage Association. She served also as the city commissioner of charities and was involved in labor and education as well. In 1918, she ran for the state Senate on the Democratic ticket, but was defeated. Her New York Times obituary uh, in 1939 described her as a feminist and a pioneer suffragist. Sarah McPike, this was a lady who I was um, quite a character as I can tell. She also was born to Irish immigrant parents uh, and moved to Yonkers in the late 1870s where she attended Yonkers High School and the Packard Secretarial School. Uh, she organized the Catholic Committee of the New York City Women's Suffrage Party and founded the St. Catherine's Welfare Association. They were affiliated with the New York State Women's Suffrage Association, which was devoted to um, getting women's the right to vote as a means of obtaining remedial legislation for the social benefit of women's workers and their children. She also lobbied the Cardinal to end his opposition to suffrage, as again, they felt that women having the right to vote would be uh, a means of assisting women and children. She um, drafted the recommendations for the eight hour workday and the minimum wage law for the state Democratic Party platform in 1918, and was one of the first women named to the executive committee of the Democratic State Committee. She served as the New York State Democratic Committee and Yonkers Assembly District co-leader. She was the first woman named secretary of the New York State Labor Department. And her obituary stated that she had carried the first suffrage banner up Fifth Avenue in a parade in 1907. She was apparently um, very outspoken and not particularly well liked. And as I was researching her, there were just innumerable letters to the editor that she wrote on a variety of topics, you know, expanding on her views and usually disagreeing with someone. The Untermeyers, um, everybody knows who the Untermeyers of Yonkers, um, were both um, involved in the suffrage movement, although Minnie was initially opposed to women's rights to vote. And in fact, in 1918, she was elected vice president of the League for the Civic Education of Women. And members of this organization, which included some of New York's most prominent families, were vowed enemies of women's suffrage. Their battle cry was, women of America, your attention please. Don't be deluded into believing you should be allowed to vote. Equal suffrage leads to unseen peril. However, uh, shortly thereafter, she had a change of heart and outlined her plan to advance the suffrage cause. Working girl suffragists instead of the upper tenor, she said. This meant joining the working class women with the elite members of society, which was a common theme in the suffrage movement after 1900. She hosted various theatrical benefits and other events to support the women's cause. Uh, Carrie Chapman Catt was a frequent guest at these fundraisers. Interestingly, these fundraisers also benefited the German American Committee during World War I, although at the time the United States had not entered the war. And in later years, her husband Samuel was firmly anti-Nazi. William Jennings Bryant was also a featured speaker at one of her fundraisers. She also hosted lectures on the history of the women's suffrage movement by uh, Ida Harper Huston. Samuel, on the other hand, was a proponent of women's suffrage long before his wife um, and was a very passionate supporter. He was a member of the New York Men's League for Women's Suffrage and in 1910 testified for women's suffrage before the New York State Judiciary Committee and again during the Women's Suffrage Week hearings in May of that year. These are a couple of the quotes that, um, from some of his testimony, but the second one is kind of interesting. You know, he stated, women are eligible with men for the electric chair for prison and the tax roll. It seems intolerable that they should not be, that they should be ineligible for the ballot, the jury box, and to have framing the laws under which they are required to live. Um, other areas where the suffrage movement was active included Mount Vernon, um, even back until 1867, where there was a meeting with uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and Anna Dickinson at one of the local churches. And in 1894, 
the uh, during the local election, the, the local newspaper was quite uh, surprised to note that the women uh, waited till the time their husbands returned to New York to pack the polls. And they did not speak to each other until after casting their ballots, proving that should universal suffrage ever be passed, that their sex was quite able to take care of itself. There's not a lot about the suffrage movement that I could find really back this far back, but this was one of the things. And interesting, you know, we're talking about suffrage and what we're talking about specifically is where women's right to vote in the presidential election and vote nationally, but women were allowed to vote in uh, different states for various elections. Like sometimes they were allowed to vote for the local school board. Sometimes they could vote for congressmen, but they weren't allowed to vote for the president in many places. Um, there were a lot of um, sort of society women who were involved in uh, the suffrage movement, much like in New York. Uh, some of these uh, included uh, Annie Westbrook Gould. She lived in Tarrytown at a uh, mansion known as Suncliff. Um, she was the uh, president of the Tarrytown Equal Suffrage Association and a patroness of the Women's Political Union, which performed suffrage plays at the Lyceum Theater. Uh, she also hosted lectures by Ida Husted Harper on the history of the women's suffrage movement. And she was a philanthropist, often taking the side of the worker and the less wealthy. In fact, it was noted that when she found out the, the uh, international workers of the world were denied a place to meet, she offered her outdoor theater to them. Of course, it's nice to have an outdoor theater to offer. Um, she also had an obituary in the New York Times, which noted that she had been a supporter of women's suffrage and was known for her liberal principles. Another woman from Tarrytown was Addie Wilkins Jackson. Uh, she was actually born in Petersburg, Virginia, but she moved to Tarrytown as a young child. Uh, she was a member and financial secretary of the Empire Federation um, for Women's Club, which was an organization founded in 1908 to empower women as well as children. And in 1913, this organization voted to support women's suffrage. She also was the president of the Women, uh, sorry, the Westchester Federation of Women's Club, which was a subsidiary of the Empire Federation. She was a political activist. She was um, chair of the Tarrytown's Colored Republican Club and a member of the Women's Republican Club of Westchester County. She also organized forums for people in Westchester to come together to discuss politics during both the Coolidge and the Hoover administrations. And she served as president of the Tarrytown Community Center. She's buried at uh, Sleepy Hollow Cemetery. Another one of the high society women was Narcissa Cox Vanderlip, who lived in uh, Scarborough, New York. She was originally from the Midwest, but moved to Austin in 1905. Uh, she was a member of the Women's Suffrage Party, as well as a variety of civic and philanthropic groups. And she was the first president of the New York State League of Women's Voters. She was also um, involved in recruiting Eleanor Roosevelt to the board. And during the First World War, she was the one who organized members of the Women's Suffrage Party to conduct the military census of the county, which greatly impressed state and military officials. Anna Howard Shaw was a uh, nationally known suffragist as well as a physician who worked with both Susan B. Anthony and Carrie Chapman Catt. She was the first female Methodist minister and was known in Tarrytown. Her uh, claim to fame to Westchester is that she was ordained in 1880 by the Conference of the Methodist Protestant Church of Tarrytown after being denied ordination by the New England Conference. She was the uh, president of the National Women's Suffrage Association and although no more states were granted the right to vote during her term, the appeal to women of all walks of life increased and more women were finishing school and becoming educated and becoming involved in the suffrage association. There were various other women um, from Westchester who were involved in the, in the movement. Um, some of the names that I came across, Lee French of New Rochelle, Adelaide Gone of Katona, Alice Alcott of Portchester, um, Mrs. Roswell Skeel, I couldn't find her first name of Irvington, and Mrs. Henry Villard of Dobbs Ferry. Of course, not everyone supported women's rights to vote. And as Susan B. Anthony stated, a lot of the opposition came from women themselves, um, including, as we said, Minnie Untermeyer for a period of time. Um, one of the things Susan B. Anthony noted that was that there was a lot of indifference, inertia, and apathy uh, in women towards the right to vote. 
And other people thought that if women uh, were granted the right to vote, they would become too masculine, they would lose their home, and they would be generally unfitted for the high position that the woman occupied in her home today. Another reason people stated is that hordes of unqualified women would get the vote. And one funny quote that I found is someone asked Maud Nathan, who was um, a woman from New York City, they said, it would be one thing for you to have the vote, they said, but what would you want your cook to have the vote? To which she replied, he has. <laughs> and the last one again, if women got the right to vote, they were afraid that they would neglect her home, forget to mend the clothes, as well as burn the biscuits. Um, as early as 1867, after the um, American Equal Rights Association had been formed, New York State had attempted an amendment to the Constitution, which was defeated. And there were numerous other attempts which failed until 1915 when the amendment was finally put to vote. Unfortunately, it did not pass by a vote of 43% in favor and 57% against. I will note, however, and you should be proud of this, that the, in Yonkers, a majority of voters voted to support the measure. In Westchester County in general, the amendment was defeated by a slimmer margin of defeat than was anticipated. And statewide, only three counties voted in favor of the amendment, which included Erie, Herkimer, and Steuben County. So the 1915 referendum was defeated, but the women just simply redoubled their efforts. And as the Yonkers statesman stated, the suffragists are at it again. And, and again, Hetty Osterfeld from Yonkers noted that his 1915 campaign had left them with the strongest organizations in New York State, an organization in which thousands of women will continue to serve untiringly without remuneration and without thought of personal aggrandizement. Another comment by Carrie Chapman Catt, roll up your sleeves, set your mind to making history and wage such a fight for liberty that the whole world would respect our sex. And so they did. The Scarsdale branch of the New York State Equal Suffrage League was organized in 1914 under the chairmanship of Mrs. Bethel, Mrs. Anderson, Mrs. Winslow, and Mrs. Castle. And following the 1915 defeat, they simply stated, victory postponed, regular meeting next Tuesday. Another sign appeared on the uh, headquarters of the Scarsdale Suffrage Association. The new campaign for women's suffrage begins today. Recruits accepted, donations solicited, the march is onward, victory is assured. And the, uh, the Scarsdale Suffrage League actually was the precursor of the present day Scarsdale Women's Club. One of the arguments that people made against women's suffrage and, and why they felt it didn't pass originally is that women didn't really want the right to vote. And clearly this was not the case. Um, in Westchester County, over 37,000 people, women signed a petition which represented 60% of the eligible voters in New York State. Statewide, in general, over 1 million people signed a position supporting the right to vote. And this is a picture of a, uh, one of the parades that took place with uh, women displaying the placards containing the signatures of 1 million people. And again, another you know, small grassroots person, Sarah Walker, a suffragist from Tarrytown, who described the 1917 parade as one of the most thrilling days of her life. The other reproach against the suffragists is that women were interested in getting the vote, but not really interested in contributing. And Narcissa Cox Vanderlip stated that the role of women uh, during World War I really revolutionized the, um, the view of women's suffrage because women were doing all kinds of jobs that they had not done before, including jobs that men were usually called on to do. And she felt that this unavoidably would influence public opinion in a positive direction. So women continued to campaign strenuously for their right to vote, encouraging the men to come out to vote and calling on elected officials for their lack of voting rights for women. Other factors during this time for better or worse were also important and helped turn the tide towards women's suffrage. There were a number of native populist movements who embraced the women's suffrage supporter as a means of countering the immigrant voting bloc. Unions also supported women's suffrage so that women could help improve working conditions and the fire at the Triangle Shirt Factory really galvanized unions to support women's suffrage. The temperance movement also had an impact on the suffrage. 
So the 1917 uh, referendum on November 6th was finally passed. And in Westchester County, the referendum passed by over 5,000 votes. Various headlines ran in the local papers, including Westchester suffragists happy over election votes and Westchester 5,000 for suffrage indicating the, the margin of victory. So the battle for women's suffrage in New York was finished, but the suffragists were not done yet. In 1917, this is what the country looked like in terms of women's voting rights. Many of the states uh, in the far west had already granted women full voting rights, but most of the southern states had not. And then there were a smattering of other places where women had rights to vote in certain elections, but not for others. And so the push for a national amendment became foremost in the minds of the New York women, as well as on a national level. And nationally, Alice Paul is probably one of the best known of the more militant suffragists campaigning for the amendment, often participating in marches and demonstrations in Washington, DC. She was actually born in New Jersey, but uh, worked in New York at a settlement house um, after her graduation, living on the Lower East Side. She was frequently arrested and imprisoned with other women and at times staging hunger strikes. One of the other more iconic figures at this time was Inez Mulholland, who was born in Brooklyn. And as we see her here in this uh, photo of her on horseback leading the 1913 March in Washington. She's considered to be a martyr to the suffrage movement. And she actually died in 1916 while giving a speech in Los Angeles. Reportedly, her last public words were, Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? So back in Westchester, women were continuing to work for the suffrage movement. They held meetings in support of federal voting rights for women. They wrote various statements and petitions encouraging their congressmen to vote to improve the amendment. The 19th Amendment, which guaranteed women the right to vote, finally passed the House and the Senate in 1919 and was ratified in 1920. New York was one of the first states to ratify the amendment on November 16, 1919. The last state which was needed to ratify as 75% uh, of the states were required to pass the amendment was Tennessee, which ratified the amendment on August 18, 1920. Sadly, it took till 1984 when Mississippi became the last of the 48 states at the time the amendment was passed to ratify the election. And this cartoon appeared on the front page of the Tarrytown Daily News, where all of a sudden, now that women could, could vote, lots of organizations and various causes were, were wooing her. And the rest, they, as they say, is history. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Colleen. So there's a few questions in the chat box. Um, Judith asks, how much ahead of the rest of the US was the East Coast and New York in getting voting rights to women? I mean, actually, it really wasn't. It was sort of the Western states and sort of the Midwest, Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, where, where women were granted full voting rights early on. And, you know, this, people kind of thought because women the women who lived out there were much more involved in, on a sort of an equal basis with, with the men, you know, in terms of the type of works they did, you know, were farming communities, cattle ranches, and, and women contributed equally to the men to, you know, to their lives and, and to supporting families. And so, and because of that, women were granted the right to vote there much earlier than they were on the, uh, on the East Coast. So, you know, so the East, interesting enough, was kind of way behind the West. Um, and Judith also asked if the Triangle sh Shirt Factory fire influenced the right of women to vote. Well, it did because it, it sort of brought the need for workers' rights to the forefront. And so it kind of galvanized the unions to get behind the right for women's suffrage because if women had the right to vote, then they felt that they would be able to have more power in terms of getting the rights of, of workers and protecting, uh, you know, laws and things um, to protect the, the rights of workers and safety concerns. So it was, that was a key instrument, particularly in New York State. 
Okay, and Joe asks, are there any streets named after any of these women or monuments? I don't know of any streets named after any of the women. There are some monuments. I think there's some local ones, you know, particularly like to Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton um, in the Westchester area. Does anyone have any other questions? Um, I have a question. When did you become interested in researching this topic, Colleen? Um, well, I said I started doing this back in 1917 when it was sort of the uh, the centennial of the women's right to vote in New York State, um, and so I with. Um, Ben Himmelfarb, who was the sort of local historian of the White Plains Library at the time, um, we started working on a, a presentation and it actually it sort of worked out interesting because the library had just opened up a new sort of history room. So we used the, uh, the suffrage thing as the, uh, the talk that was gonna sort of initiate the opening of their new uh, local history room. Um, so that's- Oh, that's I great. It's been in it. Yeah, I've met Ben. You know, yeah, Ben's we great. both. Yeah, he actually moved, I think, yeah, south. Yeah, unfortunately, but, yeah, he's in Virginia yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, it's too bad. Yeah. Yeah, he was great, and not a you know not a, a native White Plains person by any means, but you know he knew a ton about uh, you know local history. It was very good. Yeah. Uh, Colleen's Philomena. Yes. What about the um, women of color? When did you know? We've got to mention when they actually got the right to vote. You know, I don't know specifically. Um, That's probably. I mean, in theory, they did in, in 1920, but there were all kinds of rules about, you know, you know how old you were and property and different things that uh, kept them from being able to vote. Yeah. Mainly, they didn't get it till the 1960s. Right. Yeah. I mean, a lot of men, you know, of color were also sort of disenfranchised for those reasons, too. The other interesting thing is, was women were voting in New Jersey before around the Revolutionary War. But yeah, women were voting everywhere. Yeah. yeah. And as soon as, as soon as we won our independence, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't need us anymore. <laughs> Yeah, and I found it very interesting that Massachusetts, which is like I said, the bastion of the independence movement, as soon as they could, they turned around and said, oh no, you guys can't vote anymore. You're done. <laughs> Where's your hat today? Held out, you know. uh, where's your hat today? Oh, I know I didn't put my hat on, yeah. <laughs> I just put on uh, my there... separate banner, votes for women. I can't figure out how to lift this up. Votes for women. <laughs> So yellow and purple were kind of like, and white were like sort of the colors of the suffrage movement. That's why I created this outfit. <laughs> uh, there's a question from Elizabeth. Okay, and that is what set up New York to be such a hub for suffrage action rather than another New England state? Uh, I mean, I just think that New York itself sort of being the center of trade and the financial, you know, sort of capital of, of the country and things that just like it kind of is today, you know, it was sort of the epicenter of everything that was, you know, going on in, in the country. And, you know, everybody sort of came to New York and came through New York. So it was sort of the hub for everything. Any other questions? I'd just like to applaud what you've done. I've seen it twice now, and I continue to learn and marvel from you. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you know, like I said, I learned a few new things for this one because I, I tried to. So, well, actually, um, some of you guys may know Deb Palazzo and Cindy Kaufman from the um, Daughters of Liberty's Legacy. She sent me something about a link of, of, of various women who were involved in the suffrage movement who were buried in, the, in Westchester cemeteries. And that's how I found a couple of these people, Annie Connolly and uh, Sarah McPike, um, because they're buried locally. But when I was first doing the research on this, those names didn't come up at all. It's kind of interesting. It's hard to find I stuff. I thought it was very interesting and very clearly laid out. It was no, thank you. Thank you. Really easy to follow. Great. 
I'm glad you all enjoyed it. Definitely. <laughs> See you. I love up. things. <laughs> And women still go to the grave of Susan B. Anthony on election day to put their stickers. Yeah, well, that was the thing that Deb sent me is that the thing was to go and take a picture of yourself, you know, next to one of the graves, you know, for the 100th anniversary. Actually, it was almost 100 years to the day because women had the right to vote on November 2nd, 1920. So it was mm -hmm. almost 100 years to the day that uh, for the election this year. Oh, where is her grave? Pardon? Where is Susan B. Anthony's grave? I don't know where she's grave. Yeah, oh, she's in Rochester. Rochester. Okay. She lived upstate, but but Carrie Chapman Cat is in Woodlawn, and um, there was like, a couple different places. There's, um, I think, Sarah McPike is, is buried in St. Joe's, in uh, in Yonkers. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Oh, really? Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, because there was some kind of event hosted by the Westchester County Historical Society and but I couldn't make it. I think they went to a graveyard somewhere in Westchester. Oh, really? Unfortunately, I couldn't. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. I couldn't make it. Oh, I never heard about that one. Yeah. Yeah, she's, yeah, Sarah's in St. Joe's. And I don't know where Aunt Eden started. Right nearby. Yeah. Do you yeah, know I where think, Actually, I think she might be in Kensico. There are a couple of people buried in Kensico. And then in Sleepy Hollow, Eddie uh, Wilkins Jackson was buried in, in Chicago. In uh, sorry, in uh, Sleepy Hollow. Oh, interesting. Yeah, there were a couple other people that were more like uh, from New York City. Someone named Anna O'Shea McAvoy, but um, she wasn't really that involved in the Westchester. She was she's buried here, but um, but she really was involved more in the New York City movement. It's all just so fascinating. Yeah. yeah, and you know, it's, you know, more and more things become available online. It's interesting. I, actually, I wanted to, to look up the obituaries for Sarah McPike and Annie Conley, but unfortunately you can't access the microfilm at the library because of COVID. Not sure exactly how that works. So I couldn't, I, because unless you have a, time, a subscription to the New York Times, which I don't. So I couldn't get their actual whole uh, obituaries up. Well, but it was interesting how many people, how many of these women had obituaries in the New York Times, you know, which just kind of indicated, you know, their prominence in the movement and, you know, their, how well they were known on, you know, so the no, local and state levels. Yeah, Michael, you know, Colleen, about the newspaper. Yeah, I was just going to say that. Yeah. Um, the Yonkers Public Library digitized their microphone. Oh, oh really? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's available through newspapers.com. Yeah, the time isn't on that because I have a subscription oh, to New York. Yeah. yeah, but the time isn't there. And, you know, and what's interesting is apparently there was, a, you know, a large obituary for a lot of these women. But in the Daily Post, unlike Sarah McPike, there was like that little, like a little thing like this big. <laughs> that was mm -hmm. it. And I mean, she yeah, was I wonder if anyone... in a lot of things. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I thought she was involved in so many different organizations and different causes. And yet there was just this little yeah blurby thing for her uh you know her obituary yeah you know maybe i'll search for her in um the newspaper archive through the library yeah yeah i, I don't know if i more. go to the library if i can access the times archives on the library computers i thought of that after i left and they told me i couldn't do the microfilm oh okay fine it just be interesting to see um yeah I could um, take a look um, through the uh, library newspapers mm -hmm. archive. Yeah. And you might be able to find it there. Um, yeah. Because you're, you uh, you're in New Jersey, right? Or are you no, in... I'm in New York. I'm in White Plains. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, you might be able to um, access so they might, it. It might be like on the library computer. It might be uh, accessible. Yeah, I could double they check. Have a subscription, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, I could double check. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because, you know, um, I've been able to research, you know, from my home computer. Oh, yeah. I use the newspaper archive myself. So, okay. You might be able to. Yeah, I'll try and check it out. Yeah. 
Great. All right. Well, thank you so much, um, yeah, thank Colleen. You. I learned a lot. Great. Well, yeah, it was really interesting. Good. Well, I hope I learned a lot of things too. <laughs> um, All righty. Okay. Yeah, and thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Michael, for arranging this. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, Michael. Great, Colleen. All right, thanks again. Bye-bye. Thank right, good night. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Same with you. All righty. Bye-bye. Good night. Okay, good night, everyone.